counselor, mighty God is everlasting father and the prince of of peace, we love talking about you, the of wonderful counselor, mighty God, is me, yes he is, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord and good morning and welcome to CTK Sunday School. Isn't it good to be back in church? Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap and thank the Lord that we can be here. First of all, in the house, we're so glad to have you. We do have many that are sick, many that are sick. and We'll be talking about that and praying for those specifically in our next service, but uh, we're excited. I'm excited about today, and I'm excited about Sunday school this morning. This is going to be something different, and I hope there's some people that are joining us online. And if they miss this, they can go back. They won't want to miss this uh, and ca catch these stories. But this month of December, in our Sunday school hour, we're taking a break here in the adult class, and we're titling this "Go Tell It on the Mountain." Go tell it on the mountain, and it is a testimony series where we are, I am going to interview different people here, a part of the CTK family, and let them share their testimonies. Now, so often you come to church, 
And uh, we come uh, weekly to worship with people, but we are not aware of the stories that sit right around us, that sit right here around us. And so that's our goal and our intent, just to highlight some things. And I know we wouldn't have enough time to go through everybody's story, but there are some incredible stories here. Go Tell It on the Mountain is a Christmas hymn that we sing that highlights the, uh, the, the uh, message of Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, when it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And they told them, go, proclaim, tell what you've seen. They told the shepherds, go and tell everyone what you've seen. And the nativity scene in Scripture, I know it doesn't all play out in reality. It probably didn't play out like each of our little nativity scenes that we have at home. And they were probably not all there together at the same time, just like that. But one cool thing about the nativity scene that it captures is it captures the spectrum of humanity that is present at the birth of Christ. You have those that are humble shepherds. You have uh, the baby in the manger. You have Mary and Joseph. And then you have the wise men, uh, men of great affluence, great wealth. And they all come together and they're at the same place. That in, uh, in a scene, in a portrait, is truly the picture of the church that God brings us from all different walks of life, and he brings us together and makes us a part of the body of Christ. How many are thankful to be a part of the family of God? Thankful that God brought you here. And each of us have things in our past and stories that, that we would uh, be surprised to learn about one another. And so today I have two special guests here with us, and I'm very happy to have Sister Dawn Greathouse who is our prayer director and coordinator here at CTK, and Pastor Matt Carraway, of course, Pastor Truth Church in Waterloo. Now, when you meet Pastor Matt and Sister Dawn, and you see them working and ministering around the church, you just assume that they have always been in church, and they're just part of it, and uh, they are such an integral part of what God is doing right now in the Metro East. But their stories have not always been that way. And in fact, in some ways, maybe this is a shock and this is a surprise that you're sitting here today. You would never have imagined what God has done with you. So, Sister Dawn, we want to start with you because CTK, uh, which wasn't called CTK back then, but is actually the first church that you ever came into. And I want you to tell us your story a little bit. Okay, God began to draw me with dreams about eternity when I was 12 years old. Wow. I was raised in a Catholic church, and I did, had never read the Bible, just what I had heard in the church. But I remember crying and screaming for my mom because eternity, I would tell her, eternity is so long, mom. It's so long. I, I want to be saved. And she didn't really know how, how to de deal with that. And so um, when I was a teenager, I began to search into all different kind of religions. I did a report on it for one of my classes. I attended a multitude of churches. I became a Jesus freak, <laughs> hanging out at all the coffee houses. And I repented of my sins. And I embroidered Jesus saves all over my jeans. And uh, I loved going to the coffee houses on Friday night and listening to Christian music. Uh, my mom and dad did not like that. And I remember praying to the Lord about truth one night. I asked God to help me find the true way. Because I didn't want to get to the end of my life and be lost. I said, I don't want to sit in a church all my life and be lost. I want the truth. And so I began to search, and I, I went to so many more churches. And um, I got a job at Kmart, and I was 17 years old. 
and Kay worked there too. We went to high school together, but we really did it. We just knew each other to say hi. And uh, so she invited me to church, and uh, several times, I think. And finally, I said, okay, I'll go, go, go with you. So I walked in the door one night, uh, my first time in a Pentecostal church. And I heard God speak to me, and he said, this is what you've been looking for. I said, oh, wow, okay. I was all excited. I w w went in, and I was ready to receive what God was telling me until service started. And before that, people were hugging me, and I was not used to that at all. And uh, uh, so I went home from church, and I told my mom that I would ne never go back to that kind of church because the people were rude, and they spoke when the speaker was talking, and they wanted to hug on me, and I thought they were a little crazy. <laughs> but I felt something that I could not deny, and God began to deal with my heart. And at night when I would pray, I would feel God's presence drawing me back. And I, so I went back, and the Lord began to deal with my heart, and I wrestled with him because I did not want to give up my pants, and I did not want to act like they acted. And I thought, Lord, is this really truth? Because I want to do and live in truth. And so uh, we wrestled some more, me and God. And one night I was uh, driving my car, and I was fighting the Lord. And he spoke to me, and he said, Dawn, in an audible voice, I heard it. I want all of you or nothing. And I said, okay, God, I'll give you all. So finally, I gave up. <laughs> I quit, quit fighting God. And I only had one dress, and it was back when many dresses were in style. It was very many. I had, but it was the only one I had. So I think I wore that to the first service. I went, went back, and um, I told my mom I'm not, not wearing pants anymore. She said, yes, you are. I bought you all those clothes. <laughs> but I just gave it to God, and I said, God, you can deal with my mom. My mom did not want me going to the Pentecostal church. My dad, dad didn't go to church. But, but, but he thought it was of the devil. He, he was raised Church of Christ, and they taught that. And so he was against it too. But God has a way of working everything out. When I decided to get baptized, I was filled with the Holy Ghost in the Sunday school room when we went back to change after I was baptized. And Morgan Bell's grandmother was praying with me and Sister uh, Nancy Crossan. And God fell in that room, and all of us started speaking in tongues. And Sister Janet spoke in tongues for two, two days. She couldn't speak English. God's presence was so strong in that place. And, and God saved me in a mighty way. He chose me when I was the only one out of my whole big, big family to, to come into Pentecost and truth. Amen. What a testimony, and what a powerful, powerful thing. I, I, I have never ceased to amaze, be amazed by how God has a way to find each of us. Even when we're not in the church, he'll send dreams. He'll speak to us audibly. And uh, the Lord, how many are thankful that God speaks to you? He speaks to each of us in individual ways. And... Brother Caraway, on the flip side, your story is a little bit different. You were raised in a Pentecostal home and a man that has a great heritage. Your grandfather was in ministry and a pastor. And on the different note, 
you walked away from the Lord. There came a season in your life where you walked away, and we know the end of that story. So talk to us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Uh, first, allow me to say that Sister Dawn's testimony really encourages me because some of the exact things, the exact reasons that she said initially she would never go back to a Pentecostal church line up with the reasons we've had people in Waterloo tell us they wouldn't come back to our church. So that gives me hope. And that can be frustrating at times, you know, to, to hear some people say those things. But now I see what God can do through the midst of that. Amen. But yes, I uh, raised, raised in a Pentecostal home at one point. Some of you know some of my grandparents, grandfathers and great-grandfathers. They were all licensed ministers, church planners, pastors. Um, so I, I'm very thankful for that heritage, but I haven't always been thankful for that. Uh, and really, I could say that I took it for granted. I, I didn't know what I had. I didn't realize what I had. Everybody always brought it up, and I'm a big deal, you know. Um, and when I was younger, teenage years, I was looking every direction for happiness, for fulfillment, uh, for purpose. I, I was looking everywhere other than right in front of me. <laughs> And, and I can say I was backslid before people realized that I was backslid. It started with just being lukewarm. I was in church three times a week, but the church was not in me. There's a big difference there. And when I did get older, finally started getting older and, and making decisions for myself, um, I was playing baseball. I was on a full-ride scholarship. And as I've sat and prepared for this, knowing what we were going to be talking about, I thought of all the people that have been in my life. And God was calling me, and God calls all of us to be leaders, but I wasn't a leader. I was a follower. And I was allowing, when I was 18, 19 years old, I allowed the wrong people to have an influence on my life. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but it was just very immature of me uh, because I had great people in my life. I had great people in my family and uh, in the church that I grew up in, leaders that I could follow and trust, and I chose not to do that. I got a full-ride scholarship, moved, moved out of the house, and really went off the deep end for a season. And when I say deep end, we don't have time to go up just how deep, go into that. But it, it was not pretty. It was not pretty at all. And then I was just all over the place. Um, played baseball for a season, full-ride scholarship. Uh, pursued that, quit that when um, it was not fulfilling to me. Um, and then I got a job. It seemed really, I had great opportunities in front of me too. I got a job working at a high school. I was coaching baseball. I was going to be, uh, I was talking to a couple different colleges about actually coaching at the collegiate level. And again, just wasn't happy, wasn't fulfilled. On the outside, people would think, oh, he's got it made. Everything that he's been talking about is coming to pass now, blah, blah, blah. But it, there was just a void inside of me. And keep in mind that the whole time this was happening, I was still going to church regularly. You know, uh, what I was pursuing hindered that every once in a while with trips and being out of town. But uh, I was, listen, I had Marilyn Caraway as a mother. <laughs> and if I wasn't in church, she was the kind of mom that, that would drag me there <laughs> if need be. And if she's watching right now, she's laughing, but I'm not joking. Uh, that was true. So I was going to church, and I was backslid on the pew. I was backslid as the day was long, and, and that revealed itself over time. But now going back to the people, the people, the people that I should have followed all along, Continued love. I, I sat here and I think the, the people that I grew up with, the people like Kevin Drake and, and Pastor Chitwood and uh, my parents and my in laws, they saw the worst of me. But while they were seeing the worst of me, they knew that the best of me was there. And that's really what 
I don't mean to get ahead of myself here, but that's really what, what drew me back. That is, uh, I think there's so many people that can relate because they may never miss the attendance sheet, but you can become lukewarm. You can drift and live in what less than what God has for you. Um, so you walked away. How, how long was that season, just for context, well, before uh, you come back? It was a couple of years. Couple a of years. couple of years, yeah. And even when I realized, too, that I wasn't where I needed to be, I was hard-headed, too. Uh, and, <laughs> and I would fight it. So I, I talked about the baseball scholarship and the coaching opportunities. And, and that was going to be a very real career for me. And then I quit. <laughs> So all of these opportunities were coming up, but they weren't fulfilling. So I just, I would quit. I would walk away. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to work in the coal mining industry. So at that point, I, <laughs> I was looking at, do I want $60,000 worth of debt to continue school? Or do I want $60,000 a year to, <laughs> to, to buy a boat and truck and all of this stuff? You know. So at that point, I made that choice. And God was dealing with me probably more than what people realized because the more he dealt with me, the more I ran yeah. and went in further into a lifestyle of sin, uh, a worldly lifestyle, all the while still going to church and yeah. attending church. So you never s broke off totally from the church. You're, you're right. sort of floating under the radar. Right. But people knew. Pe I mean, you can't. I didn't want to think they knew. <laughs> <laughs> but people knew. Uh, yeah, absolutely. People knew. I remember, well, there's some stories I could tell. <laughs> and looking looking back, I'm like, man, they were very gracious with me. Amen. They were very loving, very caring. They never, a lot of people never gave up on me. I'm, I'm the definition of a debtor yeah. in, in my life. So much, I think, of our walk with God is concerned with the relationships outside of just us. So not just relationship with the Lord, but with those in our peer group right. and our family. And you've right. referenced that and you've talked about that. Yeah. And I want to switch back to Sister Dawn because that can be maybe the hardest thing for somebody coming to the Lord when they're coming to the Lord, in essence, alone from their previous worldview. You would ultimately lead some of your family, but that didn't happen overnight. So talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, like I said, my mom and dad did not like me going to so she. Uh, a lot of times would drag me to the Catholic Church and make me go into the confessional and <laughs> tell the priest how bad I was <laughs> for, being a for, right? being, yeah. for wanting to go to a different <laughs> church. <laughs> but uh, uh, I can remember praying in my room just about every night for my family. I can remember one night when I was praying, uh, my mom came and started banging on the door and she said, don't pray for me, don't pray for me. And I opened up the door and she slapped me in the face. Now, I, I love my mom, but the devil gets in yes, people. Yes. And uh, we had our testing, <laughs> especially as a teenager. Uh, uh, so anyway, she slapped me and she said, don't you pray for me. And I said, Mom, I love you. And she didn't like that, so she hit me again. And... Um, but, but they didn't, my mom didn't understand right, about right. Pentecost. She'd been raised Catholic all her life. She couldn't understand. And my grandma said, you're going to die from fasting. You need to stop fasting. Yeah. You know, they, they didn't understand right, right. it. The, the devil keeps them ignorant sometimes yes, of yes, the things yes. of God. And so they... Um, eventually, my mom will let me bring my little brother, Gary, he was 12 years old, to church with me. I was shocked, but she let him come, and uh, he, he loved it, so he didn't want to go back to the Catholic Church. And then uh, my dad, one day, I got to talk to him. I wrote him a letter. And he read it, and I talked talk to him, and we cried together, and 
he, he started searching for God, and I brought him to revivals, which uh, he, he, he did. It. He remembered down in East St. Louis throwing tomatoes at the people in the wow. Pentecostal <laughs> church and standing outside, and wow. he, he thought it was of the devil. But God filled him with the Holy Ghost at work on break one day. And God filled my little brother with the Holy Ghost. And then my older brother started coming. And uh, God moved in their lives. And my dad died saved. Um, he was our worship leader. Yes, right. He used to dance the aisles. He said, I used to dance for the world. Now I dance for Jesus. Amen. And he lo loved to worship the Lord. And uh, even when he was going through can cancer, he was, that was his one time a week that he felt good was when he ca wow. came to wow. church yes. and he Praise would still God. try to have the strength to worship the Lord but I'm so thankful that God saved his soul uh, my mom still fought <laughs> yeah. but she did get baptized Amen. and got the Holy Ghost um, yes. and <laughs> she didn't um, which we me and my dad didn't understand but she didn't confess it to, yeah. to, and live it but but God, she's in God's hands. Right. I, right. I can't question God. I just say, God, she's in your hands. Uh, so I'm just thankful for what God did in my family. Amen. I think we ought to give the Lord a hand clap of thanksgiving. <laughs> Amen. And I, I didn't know him in this regard, but your dad was the worship leader of this church many years and was a huge inspiration. And I know I've heard tremendous stories of his testimony and leading the worship and everything and, and how God brought your family, part of your family in. Such an incredible testimony. What would you say to that person right now that is at that point of feeling all alone <laughs> and their family's fighting them? You said, you know, they didn't understand. They didn't see. What would you say in that season? What was the greatest thing you needed to give? Uh, if you're young, like I was a teenager, I would say respect your parents. All right. Respect their wishes, but just pray, God, you allow me to, to be able to go to church. There were times I didn't have the money to drive, but I pray, God, you can get me to church because I knew my parents wouldn't give me the money for gas to get there. And God made a way. There was many times I went on empty and come home on empty. <laughs> God, God saw fit to bring me. But I would say respect them, but love them and pray for them. The only way I got through those years was prayer. I would go in my room every night and pray for them to be saved. And I would pray, God, help me to do, do my best to be an example before them. And it's God is able, if he touched my dad, who had, <laughs> hadn't gone to church for years, who yeah. thought this was of the devil, and God filled him with the Holy yeah. Ghost and Praise changed God. his life. And then God touched, he, he used to drink, and uh, my brother who used to drink and get angry and mean, uh, God, God touched Danny Amen. Amen. <laughs> and changed his life. Um, know that God can do it for Amen. you. He's no respecter of per person. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. What a beautiful testimony. Amen. Uh, I know we're going to run out of time today, but that's all right, because as you hear more, you want to hear more. Um, Brother Caraway, fast forwarding, you, you, you were out of church, and you made your way back into church, and then you have an accident right? that yeah. seems like it could derail a lot of things sure. in your life. Sure. And I, just want, I, I don't want to rush you, but let's no, absolutely. touch on that, because I want yeah. to get to the end. Well, I was right. actually, uh, I had gotten back in church, and I was still working in that industry, uh, working in the mining industry, I mean, and... Uh, God was really dealing with me specifically on um, the topic of ministry. When I started working underground, then there was really a conversion experience. I was raised in the church. All right. So we, we think of new converts of people as people who come to the church when later in life yeah. or teenagers or what have you. And uh, 
I was a new convert that had been raised in church. So I was on fire for God and just wanted to be a part of anything that I could be a part of. So I was involved in ministry. And uh, this accident took place May 21st, 2013. A lot of people think that I got into the ministry after the accident. But I had been in the ministry for a year or two at that point. And uh, it made for a long summer, uh, a lot of hardship. Um, I, don't, I won't go into detail about the accident specifically, but I will go to this, the, the people. Now, for context, for those who the, don't know, the accident sure, happened yeah. in the coal mine. Yes, I was uh, about a mile away from the nearest person, and I apologize. A lot of times I just assume people know what happened, you know, and um, living in southern Illinois, everybody did know what happened, but <laughs> <laughs> things are a little bit different here. So, yes, coal mining accident, I was about a mile away from the nearest person. Uh, had to drive my piece of equipment um, that I was drugged for 13 feet before the, the my, I lost my left hand, of course, uh, before it came off. Uh, so, there, I mean, it's not dramatic to say that this was a near-death experience. Right. Um, it very much was so. Um, and I flighted to Barnes. Uh, I mean, it was, I don't want to say it was touch and go. I was aware of the situation the whole time. And uh, I remember when my pastor got to the hospital, he said uh, he doesn't need that hand to do what what God has called him to do. Wow. And uh, but now I'm thinking, no, but I'd like to keep it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't need it, but it would be nice. <laughs> and uh, they they did try to to save it. It it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, I was in the hospital for a month right here at Barnes. Um, two different stints in the hospital uh, for a total of thirty days four surgeries, and I was on four different opioids at one time. They sent me home, no education, and, and I'm not trying to say, I don't want to go down that road, but I mean, it was, it was rough. Yeah. It, 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 it was a hard recovery in a lot of different ways, but again, I go back to the people. Right. I had people in my corner that, one, I knew they were going to be in my corner, no matter right. what, and, and two... They, they, they had proven that, and this was also an opportunity for me to prove to them that I wasn't going to do what I had done before and run away just right. because something bad had happened in my life. You know, uh, I'll be honest with you. My life, when it comes to this accident, if I could just go for a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes to this accident, I mean, obviously, I wish that it hadn't happened. Does that, does that shock anybody? But I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm not trying to look like a tough guy. I'm not trying to look um, like something I'm not. I'm not the toughest guy in the world. But I don't think I would go back to the time before this happened. Because God has allowed my life to become what it is today through this, in yeah. spite of this. Yeah. And my life would not be what it is today if this accident hadn't happened to me. So... I, I've had people ask me, well, did you question God? Did you get angry with God? And no, I can honestly say that I did not because I, I don't think God did this to me. I think it was just a part of life. But God used something that some people would say it was done to me or it happened to me, and he turned it into something that happened for me. All right. Because today I sat here, I got my wife, my kids are here, a, a third child on the way, pastor in a church, and... You know, I like to think that God would have opened doors for all of this to happen anyway, but chances are I'd still be working 300 feet underground in a coal mine if this accident hadn't taken place. Wow. So I, I wish it hadn't happened in some ways, but at the same time, I'm very thankful. And to be honest with you, leaving the church when something bad had happened to me like that, it was never an option. All right. Because leaving previously... Seeing that the world did not have anything to offer and right. coming back, I, I'd already been there, done that. I knew yeah, there was right. nothing out there for me. Yeah. So my life was going to be different after this accident, but my faith wasn't going to be yeah. different. I think that's so powerful that you're putting that in perspective. You'd already left. You realize that's not what you wanted. Right. So when tragedy does strike, a lot of times in our human thing, thinking, we think, oh, that's going to be a cause for discouragement. And instead, through the power of God, right. you see this as God's opening up opportunities 
And so we, you know, as someone who hasn't been involved in that accident, right. you have my sympathy, except for when we're playing golf and you beat me. <laughs> <laughs> you have my sympathy. Nobody expects me to win now, so yeah. it's, a, it's a win-win. But win. then... <laughs> But then on the same time, you keep saying, you keep going back to that. I've always heard you say that, you know, God has not only done things in spite of this, he's yeah. used this. Right, right, absolutely. Which is an encouragement to anybody that may be suffering something that doesn't make sense. <laughs> God could be working something out for yeah. your good. Yeah, absolutely. In your life. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you said you never, you had already dealt with the question. I'm not going to question God. Right. I'm not going to doubt God. You had already dealt with that in your heart. Yes. And I think that's the more important thing that we need to deal with in our heart. We need to get that settled in our heart now. Right. So right. that when things do come down, right. we can allow God to work his purpose and his plan in our life. Absolutely. Wow. Have you been encouraged today? Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I know we're running out of time. We're going to go over our time a little bit because this is what I wanted to get to. Two people that you would think, okay, uh, Shouldn't be here. You wouldn't have expected to be here, but here you are. How did you, Sister Dawn, go from being a, an outsider, your dad is throwing tomatoes at the Pentecostal revivals, to being a part, and now not just a part, you're an integral part. Somebody comes in today, they're going to assume that you were, well, you were, you've always lived this way, and not realize all the things that you fought. How did you go for making that transition to being involved in the church, was that natural? Were there things you wrestled with? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I was young. I was a teenager when I got into church, and uh, my first pastor was Brother Miller, and he just asked me, <laughs> and I said yes. Right. So I would say be willing. All right. <laughs> just be willing to do do whatever you're, you're asked to do. God will equip you. And so my first job in the church was riding the church bus and taking roll and watching the kids <laughs> while brother and sister Yingle drove the bu bus. And my second job was teaching a toddler class, which I learned right along with them because I didn't know the story of <laughs> Noah's Ark and I didn't know about Daniel and wow, the lion's den. So that was the perfect place for me to learn with the kids. And, uh, and then next we did outreach on Saturdays to help with the bus ministry. And then when me and Danny got ma married, we, he drove the bus and I rode along. And when we had kids, we would bundle them up and take them on the bus with us. Uh, we did children's church. Uh, I don't sing, but I had to sing. I was willing to do whatever. I taught Sunday school, the teen class that no nobody else wanted, I think, <laughs> especially when the boys got it all in there. I led Secret Sister. I became youth leader for nine years. We planned fall festivals. Yes, uh, yes. We did old-fashioned services where we changed our other church into a big tent. And uh, we were here and we did whatever we were asked to do. If it was to clean the toilets, we would clean the toilets. Oh, just be willing. be willing. And God will use you if you're a willing yes. vessel. Yes. Yes. No yes. matter what. And if you don't think you can do it, you think, who am I that God would ask me to do that? God is going to equip you if he asks you to do Amen. it. Amen. And we, we just, I've just always been will, willing. And then a few years ago, uh, when the Lord decided to, uh, I call it, stir up my nest and to tear up my world. And uh, God allows us sometimes to be shaken to the core of our beings. Uh, maybe we get a little lackadaisical and right, we're right, not... Right giving God our all and we think we're doing good yes. we're coming to church we're being faithful but sometimes God has to shake up our whole world and when he did that while I was broken God told me to pray for others and then when I began to pray for others God healed my heart right. and right. uh, that's how I became prayer coordinator yes. I just prayed yes so Amen. I think that's so powerful, being willing, just yes. being open and let God lead you. I feel like, what was the first thing you said? The very first thing you did in church, uh, was it? I rode the bus. You rode the bus and you uh, took roll. Oh, yes, 
person to grow when brother and sister mingle where they're yes. driving. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what God starts, when you start out, you're just doing something small. Mm -hmm. But God saw all the way to the future, to being a prayer director, to being a mother, to being a youth director, to all the lives that you would touch. And so I would always say this, if it is something small, never look at something and say, oh, this is small and it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter how small it is in the church. It is impacting the kingdom. It is changing lives. Amen. Yeah. Building Amen. things in the future. Amen. I could say the exact same thing. Be a willing vessel. Um, that, that's what God is looking for. And when I think about my ministry, you know, I, I, I really felt like I, I owed a debt. And I did, I did in a lot of ways because I had bailed on my church family. There, there was years when I should have been there doing things that I wasn't doing them. And that, that hit me hard. So I went out of my way in ministry when I was getting into the ministry, however you want to term that, training or yeah. young minister, what have you. And I made it a point to beat my pastor to the church <laughs> because I knew what he I did to get the church ready from lights to whatever. Mm -hmm. I wanted that to be done before he got there. And I, I just wanted to be willing and available. Yeah. If you're available, and, and I'll say this too, there's never a shortage of things that needed to be done in the church. <laughs> Amen. That's right. That's right. And the reason I didn't do them for the longest time, and I think the reason they don't, a lot of times people don't step forward today, is a lot of times we're not looking for things to do. All right. So I started actively looking yeah. for things to do Amen. in the church because I felt like I owed that to my pastor. And at one point, um, and, and now at this, at this point over the years, obviously, got married, had kids, um, and it turned into it turned into our our ministry because we just started doing the things that needed to be done. Yes. If you're looking for a ministry, just do something that needs to be done. Talk Amen. to talk to pastor about it. Talk to uh, staff about it and and just look for things that need to be done and at one point I think we had uh, we were running the church van on Sunday mornings, teaching classes on Sundays, uh, preaching, teaching periodically at the church, a youth pastor, Sunday school director, cleaning this and that, doing this and that outreach. We did a little bit of everything. So in my ministry, there were never really, a, if I had a title, it was gopher. And yeah. she, my wife had a title, it was, it was gopher. And as far as being qualified after leaving the church, I felt like I had time to make up. All right. I, I really did. I, I was desperate to make up for the time that I had thrown away before, and I remember saying younger, when I was backslidden, saying that I could never be a pastor or a minister because I couldn't go to hospitals, and I couldn't go to nursing homes, and I <laughs> couldn't go to funeral homes, and then I remember I chuckled one day on my way to the hospital after church because I realized that had become my life, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so never say that you won't, if you've said I'm never going to do something, that's just basically saying I'm going to do that someday. <laughs> Amen, that's right. And so you went through everything. Sounds like you did everything in the church, which is actually great prep for being a home missions pastor, right? That's God's very way of training. So. You. Very much so. Yeah. The, the the one thing, Sister Dawn mentioned cleaning out toilets. Uh, the one thing, and, and it made me think of this because it's not a glamorous job, but as we advanced through ministry, if you will, and, and became youth pastor, licensed minister, a, pa a more pastoral ministry. I continued doing the thing that I started doing when I had no title, no job, no responsibility. This was important to me. And when we transitioned away from Cambria, my, a big thing for me was taking the trash out on Sundays after church. And if anybody ever touched those trash cans other than me, I was not happy about it. <laughs> because that was my way of saying, this is how I came in, and this is how I want to go right. out. That's awesome. And. I did not get emotional, really emotional about us transitioning out of where we came from, our yeah. former life, until that last time I took the trash out. Oh, wow. And now, I can't wait to start taking trash out at this new building. Amen, <laughs> amen. There's something beautiful about the passage. David says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than, you know, thousands elsewhere. And there, there's something that's true when you love the work of the church. And I'm in the ministry today purely because my parents did it as a team. They served anywhere and everywhere, and they were willing. So I was just always there, so it was automatic. 
So have you enjoyed today? Have you been blessed by today? Go tell it on the mountain, our first series here. We'll do this again next Sunday. So thank you for being here with us. Amen. We're going to transition into our morning worship here. and We'll have a little season of prayer here as well. God bless you. Thanks for joining us online as well. Yeah. 